a certain way. How many here know God is God? And I just love to turn my life over every morning to him. And then I approach the Lord and I say something like this, Father, cleanse me from any unrighteousness, anything that would hinder my prayers with you. And Father, I know that I'm not very powerful, but I know with you I can do all things. So Lord, anoint my prayers. And then I begin to pray for our nation and pray for Israel. Because the Bible says to bless Israel so we would be blessed and to, to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Then it says to pray for your own nation. And you work, I work myself out of the hub. And I start praying for my immediate families and then for your families and your children and your grandchildren. To watch the broadcast and all of our friends and our loved ones. We're coming up on a new year. And as we come on, up on a new year, God, I think God has a sense of humor. Because it gives us a chance to restart to refocus, amen? I don't know about you, but see, I don't throw all of those different days away. They're just another chance to celebrate in Jesus, amen? And so I want to call Joe ahead. Joe, you got a minute? Can you come up here? He goes, oh, no. <laughs> you know, how many here remember when you are in school and they called your name over the PA? Carrie, come to the office. You immediately think you're in trouble. Isn't that a negative? We, I got you a T-shirt. Linda and I got you a T-shirt. And, the, and actually, the church believes in this. Would you hold it up for them so to read it? I ain't afraid of no ghosts. Ghost peppers. See them? Yeah, yeah. Love you. Bless you, Joe. We love you. That fits you really good. So, you know, go ahead and buy Joe some special hot peppers, you know. See if he survives through the year. And anyway, before we really get started on anything else, Lord, we dedicate this year to you. We're excited for what you want to do. Tomorrow, I look forward to tomorrow. Today is good. Every time we step forward into the future, Father, you have things for us to see and to experience with you. Help us, Lord, to focus, to look up, to draw close, and Lord, take us deeper. In Jesus' name, shall we get in the word? Smile at somebody who says, I'm hungry for the word. We've been teaching on reigning in life in Christ. And as we teach this, um, our, our lesson for today is our new marching orders. Our new marching orders. Every year since I've first been in the ministry, God every year has given me marching orders. Things that are kind of goals that he wants us to sort of look towards. How many here know when you're running a race, that your eyes should be on the finish line, not on who's running next to you. Hello? And think about that. Paul uses the term, an athlete needs to train, but he also, when you run a race, you don't look to your sides, you don't look behind, you look forward to the author, you look forward to the finish line, and you know, if you look to the people alongside of you, then you're going to stumble. Think about how that works right now. If we put our eyes on the world, upon the systems of the world, then we're not going to run our race very well because we're not looking unto Jesus, who's the author and the finisher of our faith. Some would say amen. So let me read my paragraph to you, and then we'll go ahead and get it into our scriptures. 
Blessings to you, church family. We've had a good year. How many here have some testimonies from last year? We've had a great year in the Lord. Our Heavenly Father's taken such good care of us. Don't you agree? God in his goodness has given us revelations concerning the word, our instructions on how to walk with him, how to walk in him. He has opened our eyes to certain truths, and he's given us mysteries and unveiled them to us. I can think of a, quite a few. First of all, the first one of the first revelations God gave us as a church body was that we dwell with God in four dimensions. God is for us. Everyone say, God is for me. Say, God is with me. Emmanuel. Say, God is in me. Any man, and then we are in God. You see, that was one revelation God gave us because if you think about that, if we have that relationship with God, then where's the trouble coming from? When our eyes are everywhere else but on the Lord. Some would say, oh me. He also told us that one of the things that in the last days that was going to bring stability to each believer was their meeting with God first thing in the morning. This is what he told me. He says, David, King David, even though he had problems, even though he was not born again, even though he committed adultery and he murdered, had somebody murdered, he still had the phrase on him from God, says he's a man after God's own heart. And I, I was troubled with that. And I said, Lord, what is that? He says, son, in the world, you're going to have all kinds of problems. That's why you don't put your eyes on it. That's why you don't look, look to people for advice all the time. You look to me. David kept looking to me, even he kept falling, kept doing wrong. He kept being frustrated and all these things. But my promises to his forefathers, and that's what God did. He took the man, and he wasn't blessing him in his sin because he lost children. He, he lost things like that because of his sin. But because of his going after God all the time, now, take that into the New Testament. You know what the enemy tries to do with us is he tries to get us to give up when we fail or when we make a mistake. How many know we're never to give up? God never leaves us nor forsakes us. He's always with us. So be a man or woman after God's own heart. heart. Say amen. All right. We have learned that the word of God is our father's way in which he builds the kingdom of God in our heart. I notice I'm ringing a little bit when I get my face down here. Okay? He teaches us his word, now listen carefully, by revelation. What I mean by that is we can read our Bible, and God wants us to. And as we read our Bible, it's for our soul, it's for our head. But down in our spirit, who lives? God lives in our spirit, doesn't he? So he already knows the entire word. Now listen to me carefully. So when we're reading the Bible, and we're in our hearts right, we're reading the Bible because we have prayed and pre properly sat with Jesus, reading the Bible, the Holy Spirit pops things off the page to minister to us personally. So Scott and I could be reading the same scripture. He could get one thing that ministers to his walk, and I can get another thing, yet it's the same scripture. Another thing that happens to us, as we begin to grow, God begins to take the same scriptures and begins to illuminate them and broaden them, and our understanding becomes much more full and complete. Say amen, somebody. And so God literally builds his kingdom in our heart by his spirit. So the word of God is for our head and our spirit to work together to gang up on the enemy and his temptations and our flesh. Everyone say, gang up on my flesh. Amen. You can say it if you like it. All right. This year's marching orders are this. Let me tell you what they are. This is for our church body. Very important to me because I was seeking God for it. He says, in these days, us, this new year, we are to look up. Stop looking around. Everyone say, okay. okay. That means, and there are things that we do, and, and, and again, that's, this is not a sin. This is to help us to fulfill what God has for us. So when we look up, 
what the tendency of the world is to keep us looking down. And some people have it so bad that all they can do is look down. And God wants us to look up from whence cometh our help. Can you say amen? Second thing, he wants us, it has to be our own willingness. You got to have a want to. You got to want to be with God. As he sees your want to be with him, he'll make your visit very, very good. And so we have to draw near to God. What's the Bible say? Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. you. So that's sowing and reaping. So if you choose to be aloof, you choose not to pray, you choose just to live your life, then guess what? When you stand before Jesus, because everybody does, you'll have to give an account why you didn't do things as well as what you did do. You see, everybody doesn't understand that we all stand before Jesus and all of our works done, all of them done in our life will be judged whether they be done for ourselves or whether they be done for the Lord, whether it be done for ourselves or whether they be done for others in love. Hello. And there's going to be a lot of wonderful Christians that are going to get there and they're going to cry. The Bible says they'll... He'll wipe our tears from our eyes. Why? Because we, we could see the things we could have done and we didn't do. Now, I'm not trying to put any guilt on anybody yet now, but just think about the sobriety. Why are we walking around? Why are we watching everybody else? Why aren't we getting after what God wants for us? Didn't he promise that we would serve him with all our heart, that he would save our families? He would save our loved ones, our friends. He would work the works for us. Didn't he say he'd work out our own salvation with fear and trembling? Right? But you have to read the next verse. For it is God which works in us to do his goodwill and pleasure. Woohoo! I want him to make me a champion. How about you? So it's look up, don't look around, draw close. And when God sees your heart, he will take you into a deeper understanding and stability with him. Hello. Now, see, I was, I've been saved. Oh, I don't know how long I've been saved. I was saved in, in 77 in April. So whatever that is, you can figure it out. But all through my life, God used me and worked with me and used me and worked with me. But, but then he said to me, he says, using you and working with you is because you're yielded and you seek me. But your growth and your maturity comes from being with me. So later on in your life, I'm going to unwrap your gifts and I'm going to utilize you like you've never been utilized before. And then he said to me, he says, in the former part of your life, in the earlier parts of your life, I used you mightily. But that was just a ta taste of the glory that I will have for the latter part of your life. Now, some of you might be saying, well, I'm pretty old. How can God use me? You can pray, can't you? Can you call people up and talk to them about the Lord? How about the people that you live around? If you live maybe into an apartment complex, how about visiting your neighbors, reaching out? How about Chan, sister? How's my brother Chan doing? Love to see him here. Anyway, so the idea is that our job is to share and to keep the Spirit of God in our life moving so we don't get stale. Look at somebody and say, thank God you're not stale today. <laughs> All right, so that's our vision, our goal for the year. And so we want, we want to look up more. Help, so our prayer would be, Lord, help us to look up more. And you know, there's natural concerns. Our children, I have a son right now that, I really, that he would call me and, and say, I gave my heart back to the Lord. You know, so I think about that. I, I pray about him. I think about you, the church. Paul says, I have all the cares that are in my life that I give to you, Lord, and yet the care of the churches, how the churches and the people in the churches are doing, how, how healthy is their walk? Are they able to stand up in these last days from what's coming our way? And, you know, just like Jonah Everybody thought that, oh, yeah, God judged Jonah, and a big old fish, whale, swallowed him. But you know how I look at it? I look like a big old fish, and whale saved him. And right now, we're seeing the church divided. 
A lot of people are looking at the earth and looking at their country and looking at all that's wrong, prophesying about it and doing all that. But the Bible says we're to lift our eyes. If we fill our eyes with all the negatives, will that feed our faith? Some questions. Are we to ignore those things? No. That's why we pray. All right, we're going to cover these four things. Hope you're taking notes. Number one, we must abide in Christ in God. Learn to abide. Don't just visit God. Abide with him. Two, look up and let us lift our eyes off of the things of this earth. Hello, we'll show you some good, some good scripture on that. Three, draw closer to God. What does that mean? Well, it's a law of so and remi. If I want to get closer to God, you just have to say, Lord, I want to get closer. I want to have more of an expression. You just start off that way. Then it's him who brings you in closer. You got to have the want to for him to bring you in. You got it? All right. And then finally, four, we need to allow God to take us deeper. Now, I had a wonderful pastor, Pastor Cyrus and his wife, Anna. They were a wonderful team, and that's what Linda and I want to be. We want to be just like that kind of team where we pray and things get done. But my pastor taught some great stuff, and, you know, he took the time. He was, when I, when I first came to him, my cousin brought me to his meet, meetings in a home. He had been 65 years in ministry. He knew a lot. And what he did is he took the time because he knew our group, this that last group that he was with, which I happened to be a part of, were going to be ministers that go all over the world. And he, he told us, there's 30 of you that are going to serve the Lord all your days. The enemy's going to pound on you, beat on and everything. But in the latter parts of your life, you're going to bring a many to the Lord. And so it's important that you get this teaching out to others because a lot of people are living on pablum. And, and what I call philosophy. And, you know, there's a lot of good teaching out there, but it's a lot of it's philosophy. You know, and they leave out God helping us to do it. See, they live out the most important ingredient. I have a car. It's a beautiful car, but it's not going to be any good if I don't have the gas to run it. And so that's the way I was when I was younger. I was a powerful and anointed man of God, still am. But I was more noise than I was strength. It's more, you know, this. And sometimes we look to the young, but I want to tell you, it's the young people that don't produce children. It's the elderly Christians that produce disciples and children in the Lord. Hello? A lot of people like to go to church and it's huge and it's moving and everything's great. But what happens is we need to find some elderly person that knows the word of God and learn to get discipled, find out what we need to know instead of all the excitement. We're going to have that anyway. Just think about when that trumpet sounds and the dead in Christ rises and we go to meet the Lord in the air. What is going to, what's it going to be like in heaven? It's going to be tremendously. What a celebration. Christy said to me this morning, are you ready to party for Jesus? Always. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know about partying, but celebrating, yes. If that's partying, that's good. All right, so let's get in our first point. We must abide in Christ. Go with me to a very familiar scripture. Just listen to these words. John 15, verses 4 through 8. John 15, verses 4 through 8. I think the biggest... Uh, I don't know, it kind of grieves me. People are not hungry for the word like they used to be. I mean, it used to be I taught eight times a week. I, I did a Sunday morning, Sunday evening. We did a Thursday morning and Thursday evening instead of Wednesday morning, Wednesday evening. I did a Friday Bible study, taught several places, and I ended up having to write eight sermons a week. And that got me pretty good at writing sermons. Thank God, train me that way. All right, you ready? Okay, we must abide in Christ in God. John 15, verse 4. What's the first three words? Abide in me. 
And I in you, as a branch cannot bear fruit of itself, unless it abides in the vine. You break a branch off a tree, it cannot produce anything. Life is gone, leaks out of it. Neither can you unless you abide in me. So folks, there, as a Christian, you got to learn to have God teach you to abide in him. Now, if you're already doing that, rejoice. That abiding in him is where you get rejuvenated, where you get charged up, adjusted, where you grow spiritually. Then he goes on further to say, verse 5, I am the vine and you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears what? Much fruit. For without me you can do yeah. Remember that. He who thinks he stands, take heed lest he fall. Without him, we can do nothing. And so with that in mind, you approach God. Lord, I need you. I want you. And then God says, it's you and I together. Amen? And it goes on further to say, if anyone does not abide in me, boy, folks, I, I could say something there, but I don't want to. The key is abiding. So if anyone does not abide, maybe just visits once in a while. He is cast out as a branch and is withered. And they, notice the term, they gather them. I asked the Lord about this, and he says, people that are backslidden who knew the Lord and gone away from the Lord, it's worse for them than have ever known the Lord. Jesus said that. When people go away from the Lord, they feel miserable. And not only that, but people are mad at them because they didn't stick with it. I actually had people get mad at me because I, my life all of a sudden crashed in. I was lifted up by people, but my spirituality, my prayer life, and all the other things that I needed to have under me wasn't there like it needed to be. And so I crashed in on myself when my mom had Lou Gehrig's disease and a lot of other things were going on. I had two or three elders that were making their own churches and they were all doing their own thing. And, ah, and you know, and I was going through all of this. But, you know, God never leaves you. God never forsakes you. And I learned that I needed to abide with God. He was my only strength, my only salvation, because everyone else seemed to either go away or seemed to not be there. You know how we think. It's all my thinking. It wasn't really any people doing this. And so for a long time, I was really mad at the body of Christ. I wasn't mad at God, and neither did I leave God. But I certainly messed up and did a lot of wrong things. But now that I've returned, just like the Lord said, now I'm going to use you mightily, and now you understand that you can't think that you're going to stand to take heed lest you fall. So we don't want to get a big head. We just want to have a big heart. Can you say amen? Right, Tina? All right. So if you don't abide, then what happens is you begin to wither. You begin to dry up. And then people look at you and say, what a miserable bunch of bag of Wounds. And I told you that story, what, a couple weeks ago or last week, about that big mouth guy that was yelling at us at the kager. This is for you by, coming in by tape. And how they threw him out on his ear, and then the next day he went down and gave his heart to the Lord. He was a backslider. That's why he was so angry. He was away from God. Folks, let's get with God, and let's never think about leaving him. Say amen. I'm finishing. Okay. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, look, you will ask what you desire, and it shall be done for you. The other day, I had to go to Costco. Now, with me, when I go to Costco, it's big. Everyone say big. And so if you look at me, and I only have one, one leg and another, I can walk around Costco. But by the time I'm done, it's like going through a marathon. So naturally, I want to get close so I want to pray for a parking spot. And number two, I, I want one of those electric carts because I got a big deal of bird seed and Kleenex and stuff for the church I'm buying. And you can imagine me pushing the cart through Costco like that. <laughs> anyway, yeah, Michael, you'll love that. I know, you know. Anyway, so I said, Lord, and my wife was, I said, Lord, I just claim a good parking spot. 
Lord, and I claim a cart unless somebody else needs it more than I do. So I claim it, Lord, and I thank you. Now, I went, I went, guess what? Guy pulled out. I had to park his spot right next to Costco in the handicap. And that's great, yay, usually. And this place is packed. And I'm going, okay, Lord. And I'm thinking, the devil's picking on me, and he's going, yeah, you don't got a cart, and you got to get all that stuff. You know how the, your brain works. And I just smiled. I said, nope, there's one waiting for me. Walk around, and there, sure enough, right there. Get in it, do my shopping. But God even cares about little things like that. Having what you want on sale. Having the things that you need. Amen. But you've got to keep going after him first. Because his job is to completely rescue and surround us and get us in such a place where he, like a shepherd, watches over us. Can you say amen? And, you know, we want to get all the goat things out of us. The yeah buts and what ifs. Hello? And we want to have a sheep attitude. Can you say amen? Where's our shepherd? We want to follow after Jesus. I want to get closer to him. Amen. All right, so it says, but it says, herein is my father glorified, and this is my father is glorified that you bear how much fruit? Much. And so shall you be my disciples. A couple of points. God, our Father, wants us to learn to start out our day, you know what it is, with Him. Abide with Him throughout the rest of the day. Just enjoy Him as a friend, a buddy. Okay, two, even when we have God in our hearts, it's still important that we draw close to Him on a daily basis to keep our flesh down. Say amen, somebody. Three, in doing this very thing, we become fruitful and are favored by God, not only with men, but by God. Just as Jesus walks in us, we walk in him. Can you say amen? We have the same favor and angelic hosts around us. The key is that we're not always aware of it. We should be aware of it. Fourthly, God desires our lives to be fruitful. Do you believe that? He wants you to prosper. He wants you to stop looking at how you're going to prosper. You just do what you know to do and do it in faith and do it in love, and God will prosper you. Stop asking the Lord how he's going to do it. Start enjoying the way he does it. Say amen. And if you think about it, has he ever left you alone or without? No. You might have left yourself alone and without. You might have caused a problem, but God is not there to do that. He's your father. All right, so let me turn my page. Let's go on. Point two, look up. Let us lift our eyes to God. In 2 Kings, go with me to 2 Kings. You want to do some Old Testament with me? How many know that there's a prophet, Elisha? This is the second one, Elijah first, second one, Elisha. He had a servant, actually several of them because they were disobedient and in the flesh. And one servant, you know, he, he said, hey, do not take the money from the leper. The leper wants to give you money, but don't, don't take the money. So he secretly met with the leper, and he says, you know, I, my master changed my, his mind. Go ahead and give me the money. So he, he conned the leper. He was so thankful over his healing. He gave him the money. And then here's, I want you to notice this. And when, when the servant came back, first thing the prophet asked him is, why did you go out there and, and get the money from, from the leper? Well, naming the leper. You see, because when you went and did that, I went with you. Now, folks, in the realm of the deeper part, Deep speaking unto deep. When, do you realize that when you pray for others, you can actually be taken in the spirit and come right into their living room? Do you know how many times I've been to Montana in the spirit? Now remember, God's not going to show you anything bad. But while you're praying, he'll give you glimpses of things. He's taking you in the spirit realm. You see, there's no distance in the spirit realm. He can give you a glimpse. Or, this is the part of Christianity I want you to experience. So when I pray for you, I actually come in 
and I see the atmosphere, and I pray. You want God to do that. When I pray for the Montana, see, I'm a, I'm a watchman for that group of Montana over there. I didn't make myself that. Please. Actually, you know, some of the stuff. But, but, but besides, you, you, when God puts you over as a watchman, he shows you things so you can pray and watch over those things. Amen. It's absolutely beautiful. But we're to look up. We're to be ready for him to do those things. So in 2 Kings chapter 6, verse 14, now the Assyrian army was surrounding the Israelites and the prophet. What was happening is the prophet Elisha was watching out over Israel and Judah and the Assyrian army was coming in and the king of the Assyrian army wanted to get this prophet and wipe him, Elisha out. But every time that the king would talk about his plans... Elisha would be in his room, in the spirit, and hear what the Assyrian king was going to do to the Israelites. Isn't that just like God? And so every time that the king would plot, Elisha was there to hear. And then all of a, all of a sudden, the, uh, the Assyrians got all the way. See, now Elisha already knows that he's got the victory. You see, you should already know you got the victory. I already know your future's taken care of. Now let's get after it. And so the Assyrian army was all over, thousands of army people. And, of course, the servant of the Lord got up early in the morning. His job was to check how everything is. And he goes, oh, my gosh, we're surrounded. We're going to die. He goes in and tells Elisha. I could just see Elisha go. Going, ah, oh, would you cause this man to lift his eyes? So let's read the account, okay? Shall we? All right. Therefore, he sent horses and chariots and a great army there, and they came by night and surrounded the city. And when the servant of the man of God arose early and went out, there was an army surrounding the city with horses and chariots. And his servant said to him, Arise, my master, what shall we do? Immediately there's panic, no. So he answered, do not fear, for those who are with us, this is a prophecy to us, are more than those who are with them. Did you know, only the devil only got one-third of the angels that were working in the earth. That means two-thirds belong to God. Now, this is not all the angels. Let me just put it this way. Satan did not get one-third of all the angels. Only the ones who were on this planet that were exposed to him, he conned. So don't believe that. It's only one-third. You find it in Revelation 12, okay? Only got one-third. That means there was two-thirds. They're on our side, God's side. Can you say amen? And out there in the universe, let me put this out too. There's no devil. There's no evil. It's all capsulated on this planet. You need to understand that. God threw him down on this planet and locked him here. Trouble is, he couldn't stop us from being born here. Because once God sets something in motion, it has to follow through. That's why he just doesn't annihilate Satan. He has to cage him up for eternity. Because he's an eternal being. When you make something eternal, it doesn't cease to exist. It's eternal. Hello? You got it? Say, I'm learning stuff. So this is a prison. We get off. Listen, when you receive Jesus Christ, now listen, just think about this. You are sealed. God comes to live in you, surrounds you. He favors you. The only thing that gets you into trouble is when we become selfish again and do our own thing. Meanwhile, still God doesn't give up. He still loves us back. So the idea is, stop fooling around. Let's get after it. Let's become another Enoch. Did you know that Brother Enoch, fifth of Adam, God took him and showed him the universe, took him on journeys, showed him the future? Come on, folks. We're the church of the living God in the New Testament. That's all Old Testament. Man, 
Let's be religious and read Psalm 14. Hello? Let's really get after God and have him open our eyes. Say amen. amen. So look what it says. And he says, so he answered, there's more with us than there are with them. And Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray, open his eyes that he may see. Folks, join with me. I'm praying that the church of Jesus Christ worldwide, there's only one church, that their eyes will be open. They'll know the difference between self-following God and following God the way he designed. They'll know the difference between whether they're a sheep or they're a goat, whether they fight with God or whether they follow God. Say amen. Which are you? Sheep. Amen. And it goes on further. And the Lord opened his eyes and the young man, he saw and beheld the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire. All around Elijah. So when the Syrians, yeah, excuse me, yeah, the Syrians came down to him, Elisha prayed to the Lord. Now listen, this is the Old Testament, said, Strike this people, I pray, with blindness. And he struck them with blindness according to the word of Elijah. Now, folks, I'm going to say this to you. We're in the last days. And the Bible says, that John the Baptist, before Jesus came into his ministry, he came in the spirit of Elisha. Say amen. But just before Jesus comes to snatch his church away, the church is going to rise up. Maybe you're one of them. I hope so. That we're going to move in the spirit of Elijah. That means we'll be able to call blindness. We'll be able to call judgment. That's why we have to be careful that we're in Christ when we do things like that. Say amen. God it caused us to bless and not to curse. So in the Old Testament, there was a lot of shedding and cursing and everything. But in the New Testament, listen to me carefully, it is the goodness of God that leads people to repentance. Everyone say that with me. The goodness of God that leads us to repentance. So God being good to you when you deserve something else. Hello. God healing you when you you think you deserved to be sick. Amen. Say, I got it. You see, this servant, just like the church, they need to lift up their eyes. They need to focus on God and his provision, what he's already done, what he promises to do. With that, our hope is lifted up. Hope deferred or hope put down makes the heart sick. God gives us hope, so lift your eyes. Say amen. Let's go to point two. Draw close to God. Oh, this be point three, isn't it? Draw close, closer to God. See, Christians, children of the Most High, we need to keep our eyes on Jesus. Help us, Lord. We are to allow him to fully illuminate our life. Stop running your life. Stop worrying about how you're going to get your next payments. You're in the way. That's why Jesus said, take no anxious thoughts saying, what shall we eat? Who's going to do this? I don't see this. I don't see that. Because God knows all of those things. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. All right. Amen. Another thing is the church must be filled with hope and vision for God and his son to give us and to help our stepping through our life with him. All right, draw, cl draw close to God. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 19 through 25. Draw closer to God. That's something, it's an act of your will. God is not going to knock you down, make you get closer. Oftentimes, that's what happens, though. We won't listen to God. We won't pray. We won't do that. And then something breaks and something devastating happens. And immediately run to God. Why do we do that? You should be running to God so those things don't happen. You see, God has not put you on a roller coaster and say, ride with me. Hello? Hello? He says, get in the boat. I'm going to float you above the curse. All right. 
So draw closer to God. Hebrews 10, verse 19. Listen. Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter into the holiness by the blood of Jesus. See, you can come right into the presence of God. Verse 20. By a new and living way, Jesus being that way, which he consecrated it for us through the veil. Remember back in the Old Testament, Moses had a veil over him. There was a veil in the temple. And when Jesus rose from the dead, he broke that veil. That is his flesh. Now, verse 21, and having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a what? A true heart in full assurance of faith. Having our hearts sprinkled from the evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our faith without wavering, for he who was promised is faithful. And let us not consider, or excuse me, and let us consider one another. Now listen to this. To stir up love and good works. How do we do that? That they not forsake the assembling of ourselves together as a manner of some, but exhorting one another so much the more as you see the day approaching. God tells you it's a command to go to church. Hello? It's a New Testament commandment. So there's no heavy consequences if you don't. He commands us to go to church because corporately that's a community. And having other faith believers together, that builds our corporate faith. But to stay home or because you constantly are struggling all the time is something the enemy's doing to keep you from gathering, which is commanded in Hebrews. Did you see that? You tell everybody, exhort everybody, get to church. So guess what? I'm guilty of that. <laughs> because in church, special things happen. Well, we don't all have to go to church, do we? Yes, you do. It's hard to say that. But can we be saved without going to church? Yes. You can get saved walking in the woods. You could get saved in your last breath calling out to Jesus. Whether you get any rewards or have any special things with God, no. Because you're a last minute, always late person. Now, I'm not talking about coming to church. I mean, you're just you're always waiting for something to break before you remember to pray. Don't be like that. Say amen. You should be full of prayer. You should start your day full of God. Amen. I'd hate to go through the day without it. Man, many times he's saved me from awful things. Just moved me right out of the way before I got crushed or something. Pray, folks. Pray. Draw close to God. All right, so we see it says, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith. All right, go with me to James 4. Look at verse 7 and 8 and verse 10. Verse 7 says, Therefore, submit to God. Come under his authority. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. What are we supposed to do to God? We submit to him, right? So that God's power flows through us comes down on us, raises up in us. When we submit to God, Satan literally flees because God is light, God is love, and that's nothing to do with the enemy, and he can't fight against any of that. Therefore, submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. He's talking about the flesh. See, when I read that, remember, it's Jewish language. So he says, those of you who think that your hands are clean, wash your hands, you sinners. And those of you who think that you're better than everybody else, get your heart together. Say amen. It's a rebuke to Jewish people who think they're pridefully religious. Now, anybody, for that matter, pridefully religious is wrong. And being double-minded, we know where that gets us. Then in verse 10, he says, humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he will do what? That's right. 
You humble, he lifts you. You lift you, he humble. Not a good thing. Because God will embarrass you in front of others if you're trying to brag edocious about yourself. Amen. And so don't resist it. I'm an ex-entertainer. And I watched a person who thought that they were really super cool, got up on the stage to preach for me when I was so sick, and he got literally stumbled, fell down about 15 to 20 times. He could not even sit on the chair without falling. God embarrassed him in front of everybody. You say, wow, why would God do something like that? Because the man had been damaging others through pride. And God will always embarrass those who think they're king of everything. So humble yourself in the sight of the Lord. That's why we don't have to worry about what the people we love, whether they obey God or not. God has a humbling effect. You just keep on going and keep on praying. Say amen. It's tough times too. Because our eyes want to just look at that and say, ugh. All right, a couple of points. Number one, notice it is up to us to draw near to God. Did you notice that? It's said that as often as people, if they won't draw near to God, then they'll be open bait. So draw near to God. God will draw near to, God, uh, ter- near to you. Resist the devil, and he will run in terror. Did you see anything about flopping and rebuking? And jumping up and down and telling them the devil, get your hands off of things? Is that there? And the reason why it's not, God had to show me. Because he fights the devil for you. You go to God, you get yourself right, and all of a sudden something happened. And and it really hurts. Immediately you put God on the scene. Don't carry the hurt around. And don't discuss things that the enemy's doing. Someone say, I got that. I'll have to listen to it again. Because often we'll talk about what the enemy's doing or what we think might happen that's all negative. Stop that. There's no faith in that. Whatever's not of faith is sin. And moving right along. <laughs> all right, here we go. A couple of other points. Okay. Where you and I come in is we share with the world the good news of the gospel. But they need to see that our lives are together because God holds our lives together. Say amen. All right. Now, let's go to our last point. Allow God to take us deeper. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, please. Verses 9 through 14. Now, after service today, we're going to pray in the New Year's. We don't expect a lot of you to stay around till midnight. And, of course, if you want to, you can. We'll have, we have games and all that. But the rest of you can go home because we're going to pray over the year. How many know it doesn't have to be at midnight while we pray over the next year? Amen. And everywhere, it doesn't matter what time, it's already New Year's somewhere around the world. Amen. So the idea is to get you to celebrate, to be at home, not to be driving around, you know, late at night. Um, And so the idea is just to let you know that we're going to celebrate a little bit, have some snack foods, and then we're going to pray over the entire year. We're going to ask God to give you blessings, that you keep your eyes on what he wants to do, because some of you are going to have the greatest year you ever had so far, and last year was a pretty good one. All right, can you say amen? So allow God to take us deeper. We have to want him to take us. We have to allow him to take us deeper. 1 Corinthians 2, 9. But as it is written, I has not seen, talking about the natural man, nor ear heard, nor has it entered into the heart of man the things which God had prepared for those that love him. This is Old Testament. Nobody's born again yet. But look at the next phrase. Now I got the hiccups. Hold on a second. It says, but God has revealed them to who? Us Us through his spirit. So you've got to get in the realm of God, meeting with God, so you're in the spirit. So we can show you things. Otherwise, you're going to run off of what you know already. And that's okay. He can bring things out of that. Much better, though, that you present yourself and ready yourself so you're adjusted, tuned up, tuned in, and ready to go. Say amen. 
And then he goes on and he further says, but God has revealed them to us by his spirit. For the spirit searcheth all things, yes, the deep things of God. Hope God did take us deeper. For what man knows the things of a man, except the spirit of man which is in him. Even so, no one knows the things of God except the spirit of God. See, there has to be a marriage. You have to get with God. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is from God. We're born again. That we might know the things that we have been given freely to us in him. Now listen to me. Who do you have in your spirit? God. Does he know everything? Yes. So what? You have everything that pertains to life and godliness deposited into your human spirit. The problem is you don't understand everything and your flesh gets out of line. So knowing those things, we present our flesh and we'll help God to renew our minds. Say amen. Verse 13, says, These things we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, so that's why we don't look to man, mankind generally. But which the Holy Spirit teacheth. Comparing what? Comparing spiritual, man's spirit, with spiritual things. So it's comparing spiritual with spiritual. John 4.30 says, our God is a spirit, and those that worship him must worship from spirit and in truth. Can you say amen? All right. So God doesn't even care about your flesh other than it keeps healthy, that it runs right, it doesn't slow you down, but it is just your earth suit. And what happens when Jesus comes and parts those clouds and the trumpet of the Lord shall sound? It says the dead in Christ shall rise first. Their bodies are laying in the ground. I always said, Lord, how come the dead in Christ rise first? You know what he told me? Because they're six feet lower. <laughs> God has a sense of humor. Not all of them, but usually. Hello? God promises a, a resurrected body. So the people who have died and gone on to, in, in heaven, they're waiting for that resurrected body to come. Completeness, see. But right now, they have a body, spiritual body. Looks just like them. So you'll be able to recognize people when you get there. And if they haven't got their body, if you happen to go home early. You see, for a Christian, let me just say, say this. You are already sealed and guaranteed heaven. So if you happen, something happens and you happen to stop breathing, God forbid, you graduated. You're off this prison. You're in the hands of God for eternity. So we shouldn't be thinking, what if I die? What about this? What about that? You see, because you're living too much in your physicalness. Yes, we want our family to be healthy. Yes, we don't want to die early. Yes, we want to prosper. Come on now. That's no simple little stuff. Let's follow God so that you taste all of those things and more. And finishing. Thank God he's finishing. All right. So these things we speak not in words with man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Spirit teaches, comparing spiritual with spiritual, verse 14. But the natural man, see, you and your flesh, you trying to follow God naturally, it's not going to work. But the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, neither can he know them, because they're spiritually revealed or discerned. Now, folks, we have a lot of churches, and I'm not picking on any of them, but they go... And the people are excited, and there are lots of people, thousands are gathered, and it's exciting and everything. But a lot of the stuff that we get preached to is psychology. Here's what I mean. The Bible says that we need to be this way. And these are the steps to take to get that. And so, so far, it's okay. They say, you need to be good. You need to forgive people. You need to make sure you're, you're positive in your speech. You know, I'm just making these points up. And you need to make sure that you, you walk in love. Everyone goes, yes, that's a good sermon, Pastor. Yeah. Except for there's one ingredient missing. Can you tell me what ingredient's missing? God helping you to do that. 
See, the Israelites came to Moses and says, Moses, when you go up there and you tell God Almighty, you tell him we're the Jews and we can do anything he asks us to do. This is in Exodus 19. Read it. And so instead of Moses going up and getting instructions to how to get the Israelites into the promised land, God gave him instructions how to tell the Israelites, you're so full of pride, try to save yourself. That's what he said. And he came down with Moses with Ten Commandments. Look, if you can do anything that you say you can do, do these ten. Can you see the humor in that? Some of you might have friends or people, they're working hard. They're trying to be somebody. They're deceived. You already are somebody. And when you got born again, you became the best of somebody to God. So our thinking needs to be rewashed and the way we can help others to share and teach with them so they can think right. Because once a person thinks right, his believing can be right. Once their believing is right, then their doing becomes right. Then suddenly the favor of God builds in them. But we can't get them to think right, then the thinking's going to talk them out of what they're believing. God forbid. So the natural man can't receive. You can't follow God in the natural, so we meet with him, so he infuses his power and helps us walk through the day. Say amen. Finally, in Luke chapter 6, starting with verse 46, okay, through 48, actually 46 and 7, says this, but why do you call me Lord and you don't do a thing that I say? That's what the Greek says. You call me Lord all the time just for show and all these happy, happy, happy. But you don't do a thing that I say. Let me just tell you. The Bible says get to church. Don't be a happy, happy Christian and, and disobey God in all the other ways and think that you're blessed. You're just deceived. Now get it together and have God line out your life. Analyze yourself before God on a daily basis. Watch your life be so blessed you couldn't contain it all. We have to do it right. Say amen. You can't push the, the cart around. You get the horses to pull it. So it so said, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not the things that I say? Whoever comes to me, how many here know where to come to Jesus every day? And here's my saying. He says, come to me, all you who labor and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. Hear my sayings and does them. I will show you to whom he is like. He's like unto a wise man building his house. He dug deep. Remember, we're learning about God taking us deeper. Who dug deep and laid the foundation on the rock. Who's our rock? He's a movable foundation. Amen. Everywhere we walk, he's under our feet. Can you say amen? He's supporting us, sustaining us. He's in our heart. He's around us. He's over us. He's clothed us. What are we thinking about ourselves for? And when the flood arose, see, that's his life, and the streams beat vehemently against the house and could not shake it. It could not shake it, for it was founded on a rock. If you go over in, into Hebrews and you read about we have not come to Mount uh, Sinai, but to Mount Zion, and that we are receiving an unshakable, unmovable kingdom that cannot be moved. Say amen. So God builds his unshakable, unmovable kingdom in you through his word. So we need to go to the word, find out, not go to our head. We need to go to the word and find out, not go to our, our rap sheet or, or go to our financial sheet. We need to go to the Lord and say, Lord, things are getting a little dry. Thank you for being my father. Take care of it in Jesus' name. And then you can do the rest of the things. Let me, let, let me this, say this to you. Boy, the Spirit's all over me. He, he's got new things for every one of you this year. He's brought Christy and Scott together, and they're going to be ministering together, and they're going to be elders of this church. If they choose to stay long, <laughs> I might drive them out of here. And your lives, God brought that together because he saved your lives, and now he's saving your family. 
But you together need to be taking this downtime to learn to sing, put together a little duet for us. You got two weeks. Amen. Sing to minister to the body. Let's get you guys going. Pop. Some of you, your spouse is not operating where, where they, I'm going to use the term they, need to be. Just continue to pray. God says, I've got that. I've got that even though you can't see it with your eyes. And that certainly doesn't look like he has. He's got that. He wants you to rejoice. I'm talking to someone. He wants you to start praising him, an excitable praise. And every time this individual uses negativity and every smile and says, you haven't got a chance, Jesus got your number. And don't let that person intimidate you. Now, you know who you are because you felt when I talked to you, you felt the Lord go boom, 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 boom. And so, Lord, we bless this congregation. Lord, we thank you when we pray together as a congregation for this new year. So we join now, Lord God. You hold the years, you hold the days, you hold everybody's life in your hands. So those coming in by satellite, Lord, watching our broadcast, add your agreement. We pray over this year, the fullness thereof, jobs and prosperity for children to become saved, for grandchildren to, to receive Jesus, for even great-grandchildren to be healthy. Lord God, begin to answer the prayers of your faithful saints. And Lord God, let us be a rejoicing year, a year of prosperity, a year where we can shine and glow and we can win souls and touch lives. Now agree with me. Father, help us to be sensitive to win souls and touch lives. When we speak, cause a hunger to those that hear. When we talk like Billy Graham, he could drop a pencil and people would get saved. So Lord, when we do, when we are, let it cause a curiousness, a desire for people to be saved. With our friends and loved ones, Lord, we look forward, even Lord, to something like a new year. And Lord, we know you have it all in your hands. We place it in our altar, in your hands, and we declare our children to be saved, our families to be saved, our prosperity, health, and strength. And Father, we'll try to keep our eyes, help us to keep our eyes up. Our heart, help us to draw it close and take us deeper, Father. In Jesus' name, do you agree? Amen. Amen. Have a great day.